Okay, I know people are still tripping in, but I think we'll get going in the interest of time. So good day, everyone. My name is Danny Weiss. I'm a neonatologist at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center in Toronto, um, and one of the co-chairs of the Neonatal Hemodynamics Research Center Foundation's curriculum. And uh, a warm welcome to all of our trainees who are joining as panelists, as well as everyone joining as uh, a seminar attendees. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Um, an acknowledgement before we get going that the Neonatal Hemodynamics and TNE Foundations curriculum is supported by an unrestricted educational grant from Mallinckrodt Pharmaceuticals, and we're grateful for their ongoing support. Um, you'll see this QR code again after our session today, uh, but it's a QR code for our evaluations. I uh, kindly ask that you just take a minute to fill it out so we can continue to improve uh, our curriculum. And uh, very excited for our uh, fantastic speaker today, uh, who is Dr. Adrienne Bischoff, and she is a clinical assistant professor and neonatal hemodynamics specialist at the University of Iowa. She did her neonatal perinatal medicine training at the University of Toronto and completed her neonatal hemodynamics training at the University of Iowa. Her expertise is in cardiovascular physiology, specifically post-definitive PDA closure um, and neonatal hemodynamics. And her research has significantly impacted the care of preterm and critically ill neonates. Uh, the topic today is post-PDA closure hemodynamics. And we're very, very excited to welcome her back for what's always, what's always a fantastic talk. And Dr. Bischoff, thank you very much for joining us. A warm welcome, and I'll hand the floor over to you. Thank you for the kind welcome, um, Dr. Weiss. Let me share my screen. It's a pleasure to be here again. Give me a thumbs up if you got my correct slide. Perfect. All right. So we have quite a few slides to get through, so I'm not going to waste time um, here. <clears throat> so uh, we all know you guys, have, many of you have seen this slide before, but we know that there's been a significant decrease in the number of surgical PDA ligations over the last couple of years. And this is a graph that shows from several uh, neonatal databases that the trend is going down. And some of the reasons for this include the more contemporary shift towards a conservative approach to the PDA management, uh, but also the inherent surgical risks, which I listed here on this um, part below, but uh, also studies that reported an association between PDA ligation and adverse neonatal and neurodevelopmental outcomes. Oh, I should have clicked that before. There's been very few randomized control trials of PDA ligation versus conservative or medical approach. And if you look at them, they are actually quite old from not the contemporary era. So they were from in the pre-surfactant era in preterm infants that were way more mature than the majority of the babies that we do send for definitive closure in contemporary practice. And the other big problem in these studies relates to the limited estimation of PDA significant, which in fact, if you look carefully, was frequently done with predominant clinical features. And knowing that neonatology I apologize. Knowing that neonatology is a field that has evolved tremendously over the past 30 years, particularly in relation to improvements in respiratory care, the use of different modalities of medical therapy for the PDA, we know that today surgery is reserved for those whose shunts are prolonged, who are pharmacotherapy resistant, and in extremely preterm neonates who have respiratory failure because of a combination of lung immaturity as well as inflammation, which comes not only from exposure to a PDA shunt, but also frequently infection and ventilator-associated lung injury. Since we can't really rely on these very outdated RCTs that don't reflect contemporary clinical practice, we do have extensive data from observational studies where the overall conclusions were that PDA ligation was associated with less mortality, but at the expense of increased neonatal morbidities, including BPD, ROP, and neurodevelopmental impairment. And there are two considerations when we're looking at all of these studies, and they relate specifically to residual bias of confounding by indication and by contraindication. So what do I mean by that? One important caveat is that the infants who end up being referred to PDA ligation tend to be more ill at baseline, and that other postnatal morbidities and parameters of physiological stability also predict neonatal morbidities and neurodevelopmental impairment. 
So for example, the intensity and duration of mechanical ventilation is not only a frequent criteria to ligate a patient, but also independently predicts some other morbidities. So it makes sense that if you don't adjust for postnatal pre-ligation factors, that the infants who go for PDA ligation are sicker at baseline, and perhaps the worst outcomes are not directly related to the ligation itself, but rather due to the confounding fact that those who qualify for ligation are also sicker babies who are more likely to develop these morbidities anyways. So how do you explain the decrease in mortality on the other hand? And that may be somewhat related to the fact that ligation is an event that happens later in the NICU course when medical therapy has already failed, which means that some of the sickest babies may have already died even before even becoming eligible for a ligation. And the, end, and the ones who end up being ligated are more likely to have already survived a critical period of high early neonatal mortality. This is the study by Dr. Weiss, which is an excellent example of these concepts. When the group in Toronto looked at 754 extremely preterm infants, and they were aiming to compare the outcomes of medical PDA management against surgical ligation, while trying to minimize the effects of residual bias due to confounding by indication. So here you can see that the babies who underwent surgical ligation, who are the ones in orange, had already had higher ventilation requirements. You can see that the graph is actually plotted for mean airway pressure, even prior to ligation. And when they did multivariable logistic regression, adjusting only for antenatal and perinatal factors, like most of those observational studies, indeed, ligation seemed to be associated with an increased risk for BPD, ROP, and neurodevelopmental impairment. However, when they included an adjustment for postnatal pre-ligation variables, ligation was no longer associated with these adverse outcomes. Beyond the scope of surgical ligation, as you all know, there's a trend in many centers towards performing the less invasive modality, which is definitive closure through the percutaneous approach or transcatheter. And you can see on the graph on the left that in some centers, like in Memphis here in the US, percutaneous closure is increasing tremendously. And we have recently explored this trend in a meta-analysis looking at babies who were less than 1.5 kilos and found that 96% of these procedures are deemed to be successful in the literature and that the the estimated probability of failure decreases according to the age at the time of the procedure, which is the graph that I put there. One of the most interesting aspects of it is that there's been an increase in the probability of technical success over time, going from less than 90% in the mid-2000s up to 98% in most recent years which has also been accompanied by a trend towards the procedure being performed in smaller patients. And this probably reflects the learning curve and people who are doing this procedure feeling more confident and more comfortable performing the technique in progressively smaller babies. In terms of adverse events, you can see that the major adverse events that are possible include death, cardiac tamponade, a repeat for need for a repeat cath or surgery, or significant obstruction of the adjacent structures. And some of the minor adverse events that we have also seen in our experience include transient tricuspid regurgitation, mild LPA stenosis, and residual shunting. So moving away from the outcomes for a little bit, how do we decide who to close and when to close? The scope of today is not to discuss the merits or outcomes of closing the duck, because that would take probably 10 of these lectures or actually more than that. Um, but in general, patients who do go for definitive closure have either had a failure and or a contraindication to medical therapy. Most typically, these babies present with some respiratory compromise in the presence or not of clinical concerns with systemic underperfusion. We want to make sure that there are no concomitant problems, particularly infection, that the PDA is morphologically suitable for the percutaneous closure, because if the diameter is too small, sorry. If the diameter is too small on the pulmonary artery end, or if the ductus is too short, there's a higher likelihood of failure or adverse event. We've also seen a couple of patients that had clots in their venous system. And while we don't necessarily routinely check for this, we do have it in mind when we do our referrals. And lastly, we, are, we are here do a comprehensive assessment of shunt volume, uh, which again highlights two different scopes of practice. The most common being is to treat the duct that is just symptomatic or 
close the duct on a baby who is on just a CPAP of 21%, why would you do that? Uh, instead of that, our practice here at Iowa is a little bit more towards an echo predominant plus evaluation of an individual risk profile, which frequently means that sometimes these patients are pre-symptomatic. So we have an early screening and targeted PDA management approach, and all of the babies uh, under 30 weeks get an echo really early in life. And this is not supposed to be a cookie cutter approach, but overall, our first modality of treatment is acetaminophen for the little ones, and then followed by up to two courses of indomethacin, unless there's absolutely no improvement or if there are contraindications. And we use a PDA score, looking at the systemic Dopplers, left heart volume loading, and the QPQS to try to adjudicate significance. Talking a little bit more about short-term outcomes of the procedure itself, our meta-analysis looking at technical success in those babies that were less than 1.5 kilos showed that the technical success was extremely high at 96%, with a small rate of major adverse events. And most recently, we published a review of the NCDR impact registry, which included almost 1,600 babies who are less than two kilos, and again showed an extreme high incidence of technical success and an even smaller number of major adverse events in contemporary practice, again showing that this technique is expanding and that the learning curve is improving. When we did our multivariable analysis, we showed that hospitals performing a higher number of these procedures in small patients had a smaller odds ratio for the primary outcome, which in this case was the composite of technical failure and or major adverse events. And while we don't, we do know that the trend is likely to continue to perform this procedure more and more often and to expand the practice, there are some gaps in the literature and we have identified that when we did the meta-analysis. And one important metric, which we will discuss today, pertains to the incidence of post-PDA closure instability or post-closure cardiac syndrome. So when you have a significant left to right PDA shunt, there is pulmonary overcirculation and the LV is exposed to a relatively low afterload because the PDA is connected to a low resistance circuit of the pulmonary vasculature. Once the PDA is suddenly closed, there are significant changes in loading conditions that happen, such that there is a sudden decrease in left heart preload, but also a significant increase in left heart afterload, because now the LV is only exposed to the systemic vascular resistance, and these changes will eventually lead to a lower left ventricular output. This is an example of a preterm infant. This is an apical four-chamber view showing a very dilated left heart secondary to the PDA shunt. And one hour after the procedure, you can see that there's less volume loading and there's some reduced LV systolic function. Like I said, what is traditionally called post-ligation cardiac syndrome is a disease that is characterized by LV failure due to a high afterload state. And the full spectrum of this condition includes cardiovascular instability, which traditionally was characterized by systolic hypotension or the need for inotropic support, plus respiratory instability, whether because of ventilation or oxygenation impairment. And although transcatheter closure is less invasive than open surgery, with the potential for, for less inflammatory stimulus perhaps, the changes in loading condition are actually the same. And therefore, we I will call this from now on as an, an adapted name of the condition to post-closure cardiorespiratory instability or post-closure cardiac syndrome. So the impairment in LV systolic performance also coincides with the clinical deterioration that we sometimes see in these babies. And this is results from, these are the results from one of our studies here at the University of Iowa, showing that there are significant changes in left heart volume loading measurements in LV systolic and diastolic function within the first hour after the procedure. The immediate cardiovascular changes after PDA closure indicate an increase in diastolic blood pressure, which is reflective of the loss of the systemic steel from the PDA, and there's also some concomitant increase in systolic and mean blood pressure. The graph on the right, again, is data from patients undergoing percutaneous closure here from our group, and you can see that the diastolic blood pressure rises immediately after cath and continues to rise over the next 24 hours.
This is most uh, recent data from a multi-center study that we just performed. These are preliminary results, um, but you can see a similar trend in the blood pressure parameters. The systolic goes up, the diastolic goes up and eventually plateaus, and the mean blood pressure goes up. And these are results from almost 200 babies who were less than two kilos at the time of cath closure from four different sites uh, here in the US and Canada. In infants who do go on to develop post-closure cardiac syndrome, the typical course is that after an initial period of stability with a higher blood pressure compared to the baseline, there is a progressive decline in systolic blood pressure. But you can see, importantly, that the mean blood pressure remains relatively stable because the diastolics are normal or sometimes high, which is why it's important for everyone who's at the bedside to pay attention into all of the components of arterial blood pressure and not simply the mean. Because if this window goes under-recognized, which typically takes about 6 to 12 hours, the disease progression is then characterized by a subsequent decrease in all of the components of systolic, diastolic, and mean blood pressure because of left heart failure. It's important to highlight that it's not any type of hypotension that will fit the phenotype of post-closure cardiac syndrome. Specifically, if a patient presents with early hypotension in the first one to two hours or hypotension that is predominantly diastolic, these are typically not part of this disease. Uh, and if this is the pattern that is being seen, then other causes that I highlighted there in red are to be taken into consideration. So how do the changes in loading condition actually affect DLV? The majority of the babies fall into the flat part of the Frank Starling curve, where they go from a place of volume loaded left heart to a condition of normal loading, and therefore that shouldn't affect the stroke volume too much. However, if you do have a baby that has relative hypovolemia before PDA closure, whether that's because they were fluid restricted or because they were on diuretics, then a change in preload would cause an immediate decompensation post PDA closure, which is not what we typically see. So we try to keep our babies at a steady hydration uh, level, at least in the night before they go for percutaneous PDA closure to try to avoid this immediate decompensation phenomenon. On the other hand, the effect of afterload on heart function depends on sustained exposure, which leads to a low cardiac output state, particularly in the infants that have more vulnerable and immature myocardiums, which explains why the clinical manifestations that we see as part of post-closure cardiac syndrome usually happen within 6 to 12 hours after PDA closure. It's as if you are suddenly carrying more weights at the gym. You can probably do it for a little while, but eventually the muscle gets fatigue and then the left heart disappears function starts to become more pronounced. Moving on a little bit to the respiratory impact, here is obvious, this is a pre and post closure, and you can see that the cessation of the left to right shunt is accompanied by an immediate improvement in lung compliance, which is clearly seen in this x-rays, but also in these ventilatory parameters from one of the very, very few studies that looked at this. This is again data from our multi-center study that I was talking about that has nearly 200 babies. And what you can see first is that at immediately post-closure, there's an improvement in mean airway pressure and respiratory severity score. But then a good proportion of the babies go on to develop higher FiO2 requirements and a higher respiratory severity score over time. So why does that happen? The respiratory instability is part of the spectrum of post-closure cardiac syndrome and the likely mechanism is related to diastolic impairment with a secondary increase in left atrial pressure, pulmonary venous hypertension, and secondary pulmonary edema. How do you see that clinically? What you see is that the respiratory pattern of post-closure cardiac syndrome seems to be more prominent than the traditional cardiovascular instability that you, we used to see in the surgical patients. So here's one of the patients in our cohort. You can see that before the procedure, the baby was on conventional mechanical ventilation in 35% of oxygen with very hazy, congested-looking lung fields. Immediately after PDA closure, there was improvement in compliance. The lung fields are much clearer. But over the next 12 hours, the patient develops progressive pulmonary edema with both oxygenation and ventilation failure and requires escalation in the mode of support to high-frequency ventilation. 
our study here from the University of Iowa, the initial study that we did, showed that almost 50% of our babies had some degree of instability post-procedure and that the main component, which was present in more than 40% of our small babies, was characterized by oxygenation failure. And you can see that here on the graph on the right, where the dark, the darker bars represent the patients in which there was a significant increase in respiratory severity score, particularly after six to 12 hours of PDA closure. And again, this coincides with the same time frame for clinical instability that had been originally described in the baby's going surgical ligation. So I think I sent out this to the trainees ahead of time, but how do we risk profile uh, which babies are more likely to have post-closure cardiac syndrome? So I'm going to just pose that question into the air, but patient number one, let's say it's a 23-weeker who was 600 grams at birth, is now 18 days of life and 730 grams, and his echo pre-closure showed a moderate PDA with a diastolic flow reversal in the descending aorta, a mildly dilated left atrium, uh, mildly unbalanced QPQS, and some of the other markers for um, left heart volume loading and a small PFO. He was on the jet prior to the procedure on a mean area pressure of 10, requiring 45% of oxygen. What about patient number two? Patient number two, it's a 25 weeker, 750 grams at birth, who's now 42 days of life, is just over one kilogram. His echo seems to show a large PDA that has diastolic flow reversal, and all of the markers for left heart volume loading seem to be a little bit worse when compared to patient number one. But despite that, the baby is on a little less support. He's on still on high frequency jet, but he's on a mean area pressure of eight in 33% of oxygen. And we'll come back to this, but I just wanted to highlight some of these um, options so that you guys can reflect while we go through the next couple of slides. In the surgical patients, this is a paper from 2010, you can see that PLCS was more often in those who had a lower weight at the time of the procedure, as well as a younger postnatal age. And this graph is interesting because it shows that the risk of PLCS in surgically ligated patients goes from as high as 50 to 60% when it's done in the first week of life and drops to less than 10% if it's performed after 30 days. And this is a very important consideration when we're looking at some of the studies that are coming out in the literature where post-procedural stability needs to be assessed in the context of what was the baseline risk. So if you start seeing studies that are describing, oh, PLCS doesn't happen, but all of the babies are 1.5 kilos and are more than 30 days of life, well, that's not particularly surprising because their baseline risk wasn't high to begin with. And we knew that already from the surgical patients. When we looked at our own patients undergoing cath closure, they seemed to be smaller and younger at birth, although age at the time of the procedure and weight at intervention were not statistically significant. This is a small sample. We only had about 50 babies. But another aspect that you can see here is that our patients who went on to develop cardiorespiratory failure had also worse parameters for lung disease even prior to the procedure, similar to Dr. Weiss's um, graph in the beginning that I showed. So similar to the surgical studies, unless what many people think, the severity or the size of the shunt don't seem to play a significant role in the risk for becoming sick after closure. You can see that PDA diameter and modified PDA score were not different between the groups. This is a new data coming from our multi-center study that is preliminary results. Uh, you can see that we added a couple more variables looking at the features for respiratory instability as well as cardiovascular instability. I'll highlight some of the um, important features here. You can see that the rate of ventilation or oxygenation failure was very similar to what we had described locally here at Iowa with about 40% of the babies, less than two kilos, developing some sort of ventilation or oxygenation failure in the first 24 hours after closure. But we also added data regarding post-procedural hypertension because this is fairly, it's not reported in the literature at all to my knowledge, and this is a fairly prominent feature. And you can see that 43% of the babies developed systolic blood pressure more than the 95th percentile for their gestational age following the procedure. Post-procedural hypotension or inotrope use was very uh, uncommon, which was similar to what we had found before but uh, hypertension was quite novel and I think it was, it's an important thing to highlight.
What about echo predictors? Is there anything on the echoes that can help us decide which babies are at more risk for developing post-closure cardiac syndrome? These are, again, data from original surgical studies, and you can see that the left ventricular output at one hour correlated with LVO at eight hours and was associated with a low systolic arterial pressure and the need for inotropic agents. So let's go back to our risk profiling of those babies. So baby number one was younger and smaller at birth, was younger and smaller, less than one kilo at the time of the procedure, and was also on higher respiratory support. Well, patient number two, even though the PDA seemed to be a lot more significant, is probably at lower risk because he is bigger, he is older, and he is on less respiratory support. And all of this provided the groundwork for the use of early prophylactic mirinone in the babies that had low LVO after PDA ligation. This was a, an EPOC study that showed a decrease in the need for post-operative inotropic support and a drop in the incidence of PLCS from 44 to 11 percent after the institution of a protocol using targeted mirinone prophylaxis. Mirinone, as you all know, is a vasodilator, inotropic, and lusitropic agent, and therefore seems to be biologically appealing for a disease that is characterized by increased afterload impaired LV performance and diastolic dysfunction. The next group that looked at the targeted mirinone prophylaxis population found a signal suggesting that an IVRT, which is a marker for LV diastolic function, predicted the development of oxygenation and or ventilation failure, even in patients who were receiving mirinone. As you know, just to talk a little bit more about diastolic filling and just a reminder of IVRT and what does that mean, uh, the opening of the mitral valve is dependent on the pressure gradient between the left atrium and the left ventricle, such that when the left atrial pressure supersedes the left ventricle pressure, when the LV is relaxing and it's empty. In the meantime, the left atrium is continuously being filled by the pulmonary veins. And in the presence of diastolic dysfunction, the LV pressure remains high for a longer period of time, because even though the contraction has ended, the heart is stiff and therefore it takes a longer time until the left atrial pressure is big enough to open the mitral valve. And that's why the IVRT prolongs. We also, not too, too long ago, published another study looking at some parameters in this population that may provide some additional insight. This was a small study looking at 35 babies who were less than 2 kilos at the time of PDA cath closure. And we found that after closure, there was a drop in preload as expected, there was an increase in arterial elastance, and an increase in end systolic elastance. When we looked at these markers for the association with post-closure cardiorespiratory instability, we again found that younger age and PMA at intervention were associated, but also a lower baseline preload and a higher end systolic elastance. In the one hour post TN echo, these babies who developed instability had a higher arterial elastance, a trend towards higher end systolic elastance, and the lower ventricular arterial coupling. And another interesting finding was that after PDA closure, when one would expect that a significant increase in afterload and arterial elastance would increase arterial pressure, what we saw is that the magnitude in, of change in the blood pressure was probably somewhat offset by the drop in preload in this population. Why could this be relevant? So similar to aging adults with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction, preterm infants have a higher baseline end systolic elastance, which reflects both the active and the passive muscle properties. So the different slopes of end systolic elastance have a differential impact on how the changes in loading condition will affect stroke volume, stroke work, and blood pressure. What you see here in this figure is a change in preload for two different slopes of end systolic elastance. In the graph with the steeper, lope, steeper slope with a higher end systolic elastance on the right, you can see that there are bigger changes in pressure, even in small loading perturbations at the expense also of larger changes in stroke work. In this other example, where we manipulate arterial elastance for a given preload at different degrees of end systolic elastance, again, the graph on the right, you can observe that isolated increases in afterload produce a much more dramatic increase in blood pressure in the stiff system and less pronounced changes in stroke volume. 
So what does that mean is that the patient that has higher end systolic elastins requires higher myocardial oxygen demand to achieve the same net volume of transfer of blood into the vascular system. How does this translate into our findings? Our babies immediately after PDA closure had a relatively unchanged blood pressure in the face of a decrease in stroke volume. And this is important because the recognition of significant physiological changes in coupling, myocardial work, and LV performance that can happen despite relative stability of vital signs immediately after PDA closure. And these changes are extremely important and may play a role in the risk for these babies in developing post-closure cardiac syndrome. In other words, the intrinsic myocardial properties that relate to diastolic function or ventricular stiffening can provide a ba the basis for a higher risk of ventricular arterial uncoupling, decreased ventricular efficiency, and higher myocardial oxygen consumption, and an increased vulnerability to the changes in loading conditions. Importantly, talking about diastolic dysfunction and the risk for respiratory deterioration comes from the, uh, the, the concept related to the cardiac lung origin and the risk of systemic hypertension post-closure, which I highlighted from our multi-center study that is pretty prominent in this population. There's not much in the literature yet about this, but we all know and have seen that after PDA closure, the blood pressure tends to go up over time. And the patients who are hypertensive may have a higher likelihood of developing respiratory instability. We can speculate that in, in an immature kidney who is chronically underperfused, there may be an upregulation of the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system in order to maintain perfusion pressure. And when there's a sudden improvement in postductal perfusion, because now the PDA is closed, maybe it takes for some time for these uh, receptors to readapt, and perhaps these babies are predisposed to developing secondary systemic hypertension. You probably have seen this slide before, but I'll just leave it here as a summary of the management strategies for different presentations post-PDA closure. Um, but in general, like I said, early or diastolic hypotension are not part of PLCS. You have to think of other reasons and consider what to do about those type of patients. In the unlikely event, but it still occurs every once in a while, that the patient presents with hypotension or signs of low cardiac output, um, we typically go for an inotrope, the butamine, or low-dose epinephrine. Uh, and if, and as long as there is no diastolic hypotension, if the baby is on mirinone, we keep them on mirinone. If there is systemic hypertension, especially if it's accompanied by some respiratory symptoms, we here use hydrocortisone on everyone, so we try to be more proactive about weaning that off. And sometimes we do go up on the mirinone that we are using. And if they present with the most common thing, which is respiratory symptoms, we try to do x-rays early on, adjust event settings ahead of time, trying to prevent the patients from becoming too unstable. Sometimes we use diuretics. And just as a reminder that acute pulmonary hypertension of arterial origin is fairly uncommon. And usually if you have it, it's because that PDA probably shouldn't have been closed. Uh, but usually if that happens, uh, because we are doing an echo early on, usually we pick that up. If there isn't a case of acute and isolated hypoxia with no other reason, always think that the device could have embolized, particularly into the pulmonary artery. And if things are the same and the blood pressure is normal or high, sometimes we do increase mirinone and try to support the babies through that acute phase. So some of the conclusions from this. PDA closure results in a drop of preload, which usually is from a high to normal state in most cases. It leads to an increase in afterload. There's the potential for LV systolic and diastolic dysfunction, such that the classic or the complete PLCS spectrum includes cardiovascular and respiratory instability. Percutaneous closure seems to have less cardiovascular instability, at least in the traditional sense, but vulnerable babies are still at risk for respiratory decompensation and for systemic hypertension. And again, this is not meant to discourage the practice of PDA closure, but rather for all of us to anticipate potential complications and plan on how we're going to manage vulnerable babies. Thank you to my team. We absolutely need to get a picture with Dr. Highland in it, um, but thank you to all of them for uh, participating in these, uh, in my day-to-day -day and everything that we do. I think we're ready for questions. Thanks, Dr. Bishop. That's fantastic. And uh, for the first time in recent memory, within time. So 
we'll have uh, plenty of time to uh, to go over questions. 